Number 9. Beyond the Physical Naturalists reduce consciousness to merely the firing of neurons within the brain. Yes, in the same way naturalists reduce operations of the computer to merely the work of circuitry and life to merely chemicals doing stuff. Or, heck, let me try to reduce Rice's point of view to the same level of abstraction. Christians reduce consciousness to merely some ghost thing floating around somewhere. Except, well, that's about as detailed as it goes for the soul hypothesis, isn't it? Or are there some hypotheses on what it actually is and how it actually works? Some research going on? Experiments? No? Well, maybe let's try to approach it from a different perspective. For those pesky naturalists to be correct in their pesky views, the phenomenon of consciousness should be just an emerging property of the brain operations, which means that things that affect the brain can also affect the consciousness. And hey, they do! Very measurably and pretty damn reproducibly, in fact. Could we get measurable and reproducible results of souls affecting, well, anything? No? Heck, let's try a third approach. What would we expect from a world where souls exist and somehow are linked to our consciousness? How would it be different from a purely naturalistic world from a practical perspective? Well, Brooks doesn't offer anything in that regard, but let's make a few guesses. Maybe there'd be people returning back to life after brain death. Or heck, reincarnation. Soul transference and out-of-body experiences. Three parent babies, the product of mitochondrial donation, possessing some weird one and a half soul thing. Do we have anything like that properly documented in reality? No? Well then, I think I'm sticking with those consciousness reducing naturalists. We are not, however, merely brains, but we have brains. There is an eternal dimension we possess that lasts beyond physical life. The mystery of this immaterial dimension in humans gives a glimpse of the immaterial personhood and existence of God, in whose image we are made. Evidence for the soul comes from several different sources. And that's it. There are several different sources, none of which Rice is actually going to quote, so I suppose I should just go dig them up myself. All right. Of course, what several different sources actually means is one source, which is, again, predictably, another book. So this book, written by an apologist, lists another book written by two apologists, neither of whom are even close to having an education related to the workings of the brain, at a source in its support. And, apparently, I'm supposed to just stop here, in the middle of this part, and read a 462-page book filled with near-death experience anecdotes and appeals to the Bible. Lovely. Could I maybe possibly have a reference to a peer-reviewed paper for something supposedly this groundbreaking? Nah, just read this other book that has no standards of evidence to support my book that has no standards of evidence. Also, does anyone think it's a sign of either desperation or extreme laziness that none of the sources that don't flat out disagree with Rice on the topic of evolution have all those degrees in philosophy, theology, chemistry, pretty much anything except the fields of biology that would be relevant to the discussion? Heck, I'm as qualified as these people to make these judgments. In addition, the brain operates in ways that seem to defy the limitations of computational machines. Most notably, we seem to have the capacity for free will. Well, what we seem to have doesn't matter. What matters is... What is free will? Oh wait, there's another source for this statement. Maybe it will clear it up. Or it's going to be yet another book. Well, I suppose I could stop here and read 340 pages written by Kevin T. Favero, a Bachelor of Science in Electronic Engineering. And he has a Master of Business Administration degree, too. Well, if this guy isn't going to reveal to you the evidence for the existence of soul and the entire concept of naturalism being wrong, I don't know who will. And look, I don't want to just brush off the arguments based on who made them. As I keep repeating, I am not a biologist either, nor would I even consider myself a scientist in any fashion. Who I am doesn't matter. But to judge the arguments on their own merit, I seem to lack, well, the arguments. There are none in this part at all, just bold assertions and reference to books. Well, Rice, I suppose you might find it acceptable to use a book as an argument. Christians do seem to love that, but normally people don't try to convince each other by throwing hundreds of pages at them at once instead of formulating an argument. If I just said, read the origin of species and not my debunking at that, that'd be pretty presumptuous and entirely unhelpful on my part, so why is Rice okay with that? 
But the most important part that was lost behind all these issues is that to support his idea of insurmountable differences between non-human animals and people, Brooks used a concept that won't convince anyone who isn't a Christian already, or at least doesn't share their beliefs about the nature of souls, including a very specific belief that animals don't possess souls, or at least their souls are different. Which means God created them differently. Which means you must believe in at least some sort of creation to accept this as evidence against naturalistic theory of evolution. Good job! Hey, let me try. Evolution can't be true because God created us in his image. Number 10. Spiritual hunger. The existence of the soul, which is a spiritually non-material component of our existence, explains the phenomenon of spiritual hunger. Longing for the eternal is evidence that God has made humanity in his image and has set eternity in their hearts, according to Ecclesiastes 3.11. Jesus Christ! Okay, well, I shouldn't be surprised at this point, I suppose. Well, let's get this out of the way first. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he has set the world in their hearts, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I have no earthly clue what this passage has to do with anything. It looks more like it's trying to establish that man is finite in his grasp of the world around him and remind that God is responsible for that world. Where is this longing for the eternal stuff coming from? Is there anything that looks like that in this passage? Well, other translations indeed use the word eternity instead of world, but even with that in mind, Ecclesiastes 3 seems to state exactly the opposite of what Rice tries to say. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor, it is the gift of God. Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion, for who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? So the longing is, or at the very least should be, for earthly, non-eternal deeds. Rejoice in them for that is your portion. But all of that is beside the point. Where's the actual argument? Seriously? The fact that over 90% of human beings believe there is a God and a life after death points to this reality. First off, I would love to see the source for this statement, but of course Rice doesn't provide one. Going by the latest Gallup poll from 2015, 11% of the world population are convinced atheists, which already makes this claim false even if we were to suppose that all of the 22% of the self-described non-religious people believe in a god and life after death. Secondly, if we throw in statistics around, did you know that less than a third of the human beings are Christian? And of those, only 13% are evangelicals, the branch that Brooks adheres to, which makes the whopping 95% of the human beings disagree with him on at least one issue of belief. Or hey, let's take another poll, according to which 40% of people accept evolution, while only 28% believe in creationism. Or how about this one, which puts the number of people who accept evolution even higher to 61%, with the percentage of scientists accepting evolution, even non-biologists, to be an astounding 97%? True, some of them believe in the evolution that was guided, but that's not what Rice advocated here for either. Thirdly, really? Seriously? Argumentum at populum? Well, if Muslims really would become the largest population in a couple of decades, should I then convert to Islam? How about no? This spiritual hunger is just as real as physical hunger, and the experience of hunger always points to something that can truly fulfill that longing. Oh, really? Well, I do need to eat, otherwise I will die of hunger. I was never religious in my life, and I'm still alive somehow. I think this religious hunger might not be just as real as the physical one after all. But hey, you know what I do hunger for? A pet dragon. Man, that just must point to something that can truly fulfill that longing, right? Seriously though, this argument from wish fulfillment is one of the weakest apologetic arguments I've came across in my life. This is just pathetic, and I mean this in a literal sense. Only a pathetic person would cling to his daydream so hard to try and make believe. As St. Augustine wrote, Whoa, 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 stop. Are you seriously going to end this on a quote from St. freaking Augustine? The dude who lived almost one and a half millennia ago? I'm sorry, what could he possibly bring into the discussion about evolution? He was separated from Darwin by a full thousand years and then some. Sheesh. Well, let's make a brief summary of this section, shall we? Rice brought up 10 supposed differences of which 
two were not uniquely human, four were not shown to be unreachable by unguided evolution, two were nonsense with no adequate description of what the supposed difference is, and two were things the existence of which is not supported by science in the slightest. Hmm. You know, I don't think Rice did so well. So, the fact that I've written probably around five times more than Rice on the same subject, and only debunking him, not adding anything else related to it, and linked all of my assertions with proper references without doing anything more complicated than opening Google or Wikipedia, should probably be telling me something about the quality of Rice's work. Eh, it's probably nothing. <laughs>